Welcome to our talk today about connecting housing, health, and well being as a way to celebrate National Health Centers Week. We're very excited to have a group of panelists to talk with you today, and we'll introduce them in just a moment. But before we do, I just wanted to introduce myself, Nicole Lezen, one of the co-facilitators of Core Investments, and my colleague, Nicole Young. You can see there. And we have our team of bilingual chat support, Gisela Carrasco and Jasmine Sanchez, and our interpreter, Stella Lauerman, with us as well today. And we'll introduce you to the other speakers in just a moment. Before we get to those presentations, we wanted to give a brief background on core investments, which may be familiar to many of you, either from participating in prior core events or from some of the community engagement sessions that have led to some of the, the things I'm about to share. So, the, so core stands for the collective of results and evidence-based investments. It's both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in our county using a collective impact approach that focuses on results and is responsive to community needs. With input from many of you on this call and other organizations throughout our county, we developed the mission and vision statements that you see here, both of which center equity in the, in the core framework. The core conditions for health and well-being are the, the ones that you see here. We believe that these are very interconnected. So for example, you can't have um, a healthy, thriving life or sustain economic sustainability if you don't have safe, affordable housing and shelter. That's also going to affect your potential for lifelong earning and education. And all of these flow through the center that you see there for equity. So we just mean that these are the um, equitable opportunities to achieve these core conditions, regardless of your zip code, your race or ethnicity, your gender, your age, your immigration status, or any other characteristics. So that's the goal of core conditions, is, is to try to achieve these outcomes for everyone equitably, to have these opportunities. The Core Institute for Innovation and Impact is the umbrella um, for the, these kinds of core coffee chats and conversations that we've been holding for the past year and a half or so, and for other training and technical assistance that's been provided under the umbrella of the Core Institute. So you can see here some of the things that are a focus of these training and technical assistance events and chats and conversations, and we look forward to offering more of these to you in the months to come. As part of the Core Institute, we are happy to bring you this talk that's part of National Health Center Week. And to help us set the context for that, we're going to hear from Amy Mancia from the Health Improvement Partnership. Then Maria Cadenas from Santa Cruz Community Ventures is going to offer some information on local housing and equity trends. And then we're going to move into some information about specific initiatives locally, including hearing from Salud para la Gente from Darlene Torres, from John Subrani, who's a, uh, a lawyer with the Watsonville Law Center. And he's going to talk to us about some of the eviction moratorium information. Joey Cartagini from the Health Services Agency's Homeless Persons Health Project, or HPHP, is going to give us some information as well. And Dina Loyhos from Santa Cruz Community Health Centers is going to tell us about an exciting uh, project that is merging health and housing in our county. And finally, Don Lane will talk to us about Housing Santa Cruz County and some opportunities for all of us to be more active in these issues. Then we'll follow those presentations with your questions and answers and talk about some next steps. So we have a slightly longer chat format today of an hour and a half, and we look forward to having a little more time to get into discussion and questions than we normally do. So please keep those questions coming in the chat, and we will look forward to interacting with our presenters during and after their talks. So any questions before we get started? All right, Amy, I think you are up. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you um, to both Nicole Levin and Nicole Young for having me. Um, we're excited to be celebrating National Health Center Week 2021 with you all today, connecting housing, health, and well-being as they are interrelated. 
Um, this year's themes with chemistry for a strong community reminds us of the key elements our health centers utilize to shape healthy and equitable environments that include our most vulnerable communities to improve the social and physical determinants of health. Next slide. So National Health Center Week is a week-long celebration taking place August 8th through the 14th of this year. This week celebrates and raises awareness to the mission, resilience, and accomplishments of community health centers. This past year, our community health centers demonstrated their active commitments to serve the needs of the community um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Not only do they offer support in moments of loss and pain, but also a vision and hope for the future, serving as a beacon of strength, care, and service to the community. Next slide. So HIP celebrates National Health Center Week alongside our Safety Net Clinic Coalition partners. This year, we are very excited to have expanded and welcome Encompass Community Services and Janice of Santa Cruz to the celebration among our various health center partners, many of who are here today, including Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency, Santa Cruz Community Health, Salud para la Gente, Dientes Community Dental Care, Pamper Hermar Monte, and especially all of our health centers nationwide. Next slide. So each day of National Health Center Week um, has a focus. On Sunday, we celebrated Public Health and Housing Day. Yesterday, um, we celebrated Healthcare for the Homeless Day. Today, um, we are celebrating Agricultural Worker Health Day. Um, and here on after, we're celebrating Patient Appreciation Day, Stakeholder Appreciation Day, Health Center Staff Appreciation Day, and culminating with Children's Health Day. Next slide. So before we transition to our um, amazing lineup of speakers, I wanted to share some local data um, on housing and health really help shape our conversation today. Next slide. So um, according to the county health rankings, 27.2% um, of Santa Cruz households experience at least one of the following four housing problems, including overcrowding, high housing costs, lack of kitchen, and lack of swimming facility. And I think especially through COVID, we have really seen how at least one, one of these four has really impacted our households locally and across the globe. Next slide. Um, according to American Community Survey, 59.1% of renters in Santa Cruz County spend more than 30 or more percent, 30% or more of their household income on rent. Um, and this includes just rent and utilities such as electricity, gas, other fuels, water, and sewer, and does not include costs for clothing and food, um, which is really essential. Next slide. Um, and when we look at um, our local COVID-19 data, we can really draw intersections of how severe housing problems and being able to afford the cost of living locally have really affected our most vulnerable communities. Um, as we have seen, unemployment rates have increased. COVID-19 infections have disproportionately impacted several adverse populations being um, knowing that 56.3% of known cases have been identified in South County, 53.1% of known cases have been identified in the Latinx community, and 786 of those known cases were due to person-to-person -person household transmission. So many parents and I'd say adolescents in these communities have been a part of our essential workforce or have had to join our essential workforce working in grocery stores um, and agriculture and working on the front lines in order to make ends meet for their household. And so um, when one person is infected in an overcrowded household, it really poses a risk um, as we see the 78.6% 78. um, percent of household household person person transmission. Um, and then next slide. Um, I wanted to culminate my portion to join just a few more connections on housing and health. Um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw, um, as mentioned, the increase of unemployment rates, which could really affect one's ability to make ends meet, let alone just afford rent itself. Um, currently, we recently um, got an extended eviction of mor moratorium nationally. Um, but really, when, when these eviction moratoriums are not in place, we face an eviction crisis. And that will really contribute to our already existing homelessness crisis. Um, and lastly, um, as we know, experiencing homelessness increases the mortality rate by four times in the general population. And 
All that is to say is that housing and health are really intertwined and really impact our well-being. Um, so I really want to thank you all for being here today, and I'm excited to hear from our amazing speakers um, who will speak about all the amazing work that they do locally to help increase um, health outcomes um, and improve access to housing. Thank you all. Thank you, Amy. And I'm happy to say that I think every week is National Health Centers Week here in Santa Cruz County. So, um, next, we're gonna hear from Maria Cadenas. So Maria, just let me know when you want me to forward your slides. Thanks, Nicole. And, and thank you again for having me here. Um, just a, a quick, for those who don't know about Community Ventures, uh, we focus on helping families understand and use their economic power to create thriving communities where zip code, race, gender, or immigration status do not dictate income and wealth. And, and this matters to us because at the core of our work is really about well-being, uh, having families thriving, doing well, and ensures that they have financial stability, and that includes housing. If we can go to the next slide, Nicole. For ventures, we say we uh, power our programs through that vision, and this is a set of programs that we have. Um, Familias con Mas is an outreach and education component for financial capability. Futuro is working on developing uh, cooperative uh, means as a way of wealth building. We do advocacy on DocuFund, which I'll share some of the data around housing that we learned from our support of undocumented workers in the Santa Cruz County. Santa Cruz Seeds is a college savings account. It's really an intergenerational effort that focuses on the child development from zero to five, as long as long-term economic mobility of the families. And ALAS is a relief um, guaranteed income pilot that we did in the region. Uh, and so that, that's ventures. So now, now I hope you all know a little bit of where we're coming from and the information that I'm sharing. You can go to the next slide. That's just me. I'm around. You guys can, <laughs> can ask me any questions you want. But go to the next slide. Um, all right, so during a DocuFund, uh, this is some of what we learned and what we saw. Uh, in the community. We had households, the majority of them had uh, children, children under 18. Actually, a lot of them had children under 12. That was the majority of them. Um, a lot of them were female-led households. So you see the gender gap, not only in the need, but also in who makes up the households and who leads it. And the vast majority was Latinos. Uh, this was across the county, and we served both from Santa Cruz down to Watsonville. So they, um, the the demographics or the breakdown of the data is about the same. If you go to the next slide. On average, the rent that they were paying was around $1,200 during COVID, but this is um, slightly skewed. It's because the, the rent cost is lower because they're overcrowded. They were having two to three families per household. The other reason for the rent being so low is for agricultural workers, say in Davenport, for example, where the grower gives them housing for a stipend that may be $300 for a single adult. So their rent seems low, but it's really overcrowded and not necessarily safe or good housing. So I want to keep that into context into that average monthly amount. The other thing that we learned is that most people were about one month behind on rent. Again, this is not entirely accurate. They are so afraid of being evicted that they do whatever they can to stay at house. So that a lot of them were putting their rent into borrowing money from friends, borrowing from predatory lenders, using credit cards. So technically they're behind to their landlord by one month, but they are accumulating debt that is continued to spiral that does not qualify for the state relief that has been done through their credit cards and predatory lenders. So we actually have an economic cliff that's gonna happen to this population on top of the eviction moratorium ending. So this is something to be considered. So again, the, the data shows that they're one month behind on rent, but if you dig into it, it's a little more complicated than that. This is not only impacting undocumented workers, although most of our data is coming from undocumented workers. We also did work with about 500 families who were not necessarily undocumented uh, for other parts of relief. And we see the same trends using credit card, predatory lender, and others. So we have this economic debt crisis that's being built around housing in the region. The other piece that is important for the housing conversation to bring up is that the average time that these residents lived in this area is 15 years. We're not talking about migrant communities moving in. We're not talking about new people moving into the region. We're talking about long-term residents 
of the county who have been here for 15 years who are facing tremendous pressures around housing. One of the things that we learned is that the stability in areas like in the city of Santa Cruz, where there's a huge dependence on hospitality and services, um, because of the high cost of living, they don't necessarily stay in one place for 15 years. They have to constantly move and that carries with it instability and additional cost of deposits and other things that they have to live with. When, when the pandemic hit, a lot of them in hospitality specifically, including housekeeping, were let go overnight and they felt a sense of betrayal and, and that they they really weren't treated as equal residents of the area, but as disposable uh, workers. And this matters when we're talking about the availability of housing to stabilize families. It's also a sense of belonging that you belong there. Now, one of the things I wanna share in, in terms of housing that I didn't include in the slides is that when we look at the housing crisis in the region, it's really coming from two ends of the spectrum. One is change community is changing, we have more population that need to be housed. And again, I'm talking about people who already live here, right? So you have what we call house rich owners, right? Who, who like the small town and they don't wanna change. And I get that, but trying to maintain that is actually putting pressure against keeping people housed who already live here in overcrowded and poor conditions. And then you have the market pressures of Silicon Valley and the development pieces around that piece. So we have this um, dual push on top of high cost of development and the process of development in the region, which is why this issue is so complicated and difficult to address. Not to mention the lack of, of low and affordable housing for low income families and for those who need more supportive services over time. So we had a delayed development phase, uh, pressures around trying to maintain um, the character of the region and then pressures from the market in general. All of that makes these communities who have more um, seasonal work, uh, low wage work, harder for them to maintain. So my challenge, I guess, in the discussion where we talk about well-being, housing for a child is a safe place to do their homework. That's part of the academic reach. It's a safe place to sleep when you fear violence or are constantly in stress and reaction mode. Housing is well-being, housing is about doing well, and it's about mobility. So we gotta be creative, not only in the number of housing units that we have, but also housing is the number one way we build wealth in this country. So if we do not think about not only building more rental, which is great, but how are we ensuring that we have ability for wealth building and development of who owns those properties, right? Like in, in inventive models that have been done in the Bay Area around moving uh, to land trust models for, I would say shared ownership so that we don't continue to build a speculative market. And in essence, you know, adventures, I'm like, we just follow the money. Like who gets all the money from all the development, especially for market rates, for rental units, that may have some affordable units and who doesn't. And, it, and is that property then available to be purchased back by the renters as a, um, a right of first refusal, for example, so that we continue to build wealth locally. So that, that I would say is, is something to consider that is not only about housing, but permanent stability and ensuring that we move to allow housing to become that 30% of income because it's eating away at ability to get medical care, ability to get food, ability um, to quite frankly, get clothing um, for, for support. So we, it's a crucial issue. It is complex, but I think we need to be creative and innovative of how we do it. So if we go to the last slide, I'll just end on a story, really. Uh, we have, like I said, many parents with young children who have been here for over 15 years. They are working. These are working people. I know we have a houseless um, pandemic as well in the region, but the fact is that a lot of our workers are working full time. Both parents are working as many hours as they can. Um, we don't have childcare for them. Um, they, and what they're making is still under thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars a year as a combined household income, um, and in part because we have industries that are low waging. So it's an intersectional issue when we look at the economic development plans for our county and our region. What kind of industries are we bringing in to ensure that they provide the living wages to afford the housing? What kind of innovative approaches to look at housing to make it a permanently off the constant skyrocketing market uh, structure? And how do we recognize that a housing issue is not just about people moving in, but a housing the people who have lived here and made this community possible. So I'll, I'll end it there, Nicole. Thank you.
Thank you, Maria. That was a really powerful statement of so many trends in our community and how they converge, as you said, um, in this particular issue. So we really appreciate that setting the stage for our next set of speakers. So now we'd like to hear from Darlene Torres from Salud para la Gente, and she's gonna give us some information adding to what Maria and Amy have just shared. So Darlene, go ahead. Yes, and thank you, everyone. Um, wow, um, Amy Mancia and Maria Cadena, that, those were amazing presentations. Um, again, I'm Darlene from Salud para la Gente, um, the Department Manager for Community Health Services. And what we do um, in our department really is identify social determinants of health. And what we have recently done in the last uh, roughly four years is really um, try to get an understanding of what our community is asking for and really what those barriers to care are. And what we have found is that food insecurity, transportation, and housing have always been the top three. And um, housing, again, has, has gone from being at the bottom of those three to the, to the first, the first above everything. Um, housing insecurity, instability has become a major concern. Again, with COVID uh, in the last year and a half or so, we've reevaluated the questions we're asking, in particular those um, in reference to housing because of, of that need, because we're seeing these trends. Um, so wanting to understand in more depth what our community is asking for. Um, and we're seeing that overcrowding has become a major issue. As Amy was mentioning in her um, presentation, 30% or more of income um, is going towards rent and utilities. And what we've actually found is about 44% for most of our patients is what they're spending on their rent, mortgage, or utilities. So that is a very large amount of money that is going into that. One of the other things is really there is no availability for affordable housing. So even within um, Salud's employees and, um, and some of our partners, we're hearing that there is no housing available. And so that unfortunately, they'd, lo they'd love to live here. Um, they cannot afford it. So they'll have to drive into town to, to be able to work and you know um, find housing in other places. And of course, homelessness is um, also a huge factor. So these all relate to um, social determinants of health. Um, we're noticing an increase in depression, anxiety, due to just having to always constantly worry about, you know, will I be able to pay the rent? Um, and again, one of the things that doesn't become a main focus for these communities and these our, our patients is why, uh, their medical concerns become last on that on list of priorities. So, um, you know, it, we're, we're diagnosing patients later, um, and instead of there being preventative care, it's, you know, putting a band-aid, trying to, to take care of, of the patient after the fact. So diabetes has become um, something that is being diagnosed. Uh, of course, our, our agency has seen a lot of diabetes, but we're noticing an uptick in diabetes. Um, some of our, our patients are talking about uh, the inability to have uh, their, um, their homes taken care of properly. So there's a lack of, uh, of um, there's this lack of, uh, you know, taking care of the home, um, uh, issues with asthma for children due to not having the proper ventilation. Um, you know, there's uh, exposure to lead. So there's, there's a lot of factors that come in to play when you're talking about housing and barriers to care. Um, if you're focused on wanting to make sure that you're paying your rent and your utilities, um, you're, you're gonna have anxiety wondering, can I make that um, payment for my copay? Am I able to pay the medications? So Saluda is trying to find alternatives to make sure that those are not barriers to care. Um, and what I, I do wanna say is this is an amazing platform to be able to have these discussions. I think that we're all seeing these trends and we've just not been able to have a platform such as this to be able to speak it and, and figure out how we can support our community to make true policy change. So thank you. 
You're welcome, Darlene. Thanks for that update and for tying even more strands together with what you're seeing with your patients at Salud. I think uh, John has some slides to share also from the Watsonville Law Center. Go ahead, John. Hi, yes. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. So I'm John, I'm a housing attorney at the Watsonville Law Center. Um, and I'm just here to talk about the expiration of the eviction protections um, in a couple minutes and sort of some of the challenges that we're seeing. So um, I, I'm gonna have slides in English and in Spanish. So this is the, the main deadlines coming up at the end of September. The California protections end. I'm not gonna bore you with how we got here, but um, this is the state of the law now. They will be over on September 30th. So there will be no protections for someone who can't pay their rent on October 1st. So um, in terms of the eviction cliff um, that's looming, expect, expect us to fall off of that um, mid-October evictions start happening. Um, folks will be protected um, from owing rent during COVID, but they won't be protected for, for rent that comes owed new. Um, and then there is another eviction moratorium. Folks have been talking about the CDC moratorium. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but that ends on October 3rd. Um, it protects tenants who owe rent. Um, so I'll just mention that CDC moratorium in California, the courts have basically decided that um, the state protections are just as good or better. So the CDC moratorium, while we do um, use it, it's not, um, it's not what we really focus on here in California. And just to get that protection, all a tenant needs to do is fill out this form, say they can't pay their, their rent um, due to COVID and um, they make under $100,000 and they can use this at any time in an eviction process. So I'll just talk uh, for a couple of slides about the current protections under the, the current law, which is called AB 832. So it stops evictions for tenants based on non-payment. So that's, it just protects tenants who owe rent and are getting evicted because they owe rent. And that's during all of COVID, which, which the law calls March, 2020 through the end of September. So landlords can try to collect this money in small claims court this fall. But um, as part of this new law, AB 832, the rental emergency rental assistance program was um, boosted from 80% to 100% of all the past rent. So we heard from Maria um, Cadenas about um, how people are borrowing money, that sort of thing. We see it all the time too. No need for that. Um, in fact, you will not be, you will not see that money back. The state's not going to reimburse you for or loans you've gotten from friends to pay your rent. They'll just pay back what, what you owe your landlord. Um, so folks need to apply for that rental assistance and they need to apply for it as soon as possible. So to be protected as a tenant in California, your landlord first has to send you all these notices and they should include a blank declaration to anyone who owes rental money. Um, if you can sign this and it's true, you've lost income due to COVID and you couldn't pay your rent, um, then you need to return that within 15 days. So um, the other requirement is that tenants either pay 25% of what they owe or apply for the rental assistance. So um, the big message here is folks need to sign up um, apply to that rental assistance program as soon as possible. If they get one of those declarations in the mail, they need to return it as soon as possible. And in my last 10 seconds here, I'll just say I pulled this off the state's website today. Um, and you can see this first highlighted number is the total funds requested in Santa Cruz County for the rental assistance program. It's over $10 million. And you can see how much has been paid to them. So less than 20% has been used. So we really need to get the word out there um, on this issue. Thanks, John. Could you put some links in the chat for how people can get to those forms? Sure. If they don't already know, that would be great. And we'll ask everyone to help spread the word. 
Thank you for that presentation. Now we're gonna hear from Joey Crotogini from the Help Homeless Persons Health Project. And he's gonna share some things with us about what happens when you don't have your housing and shelter. So John's talking about how to prevent that from happening. And, and we're gonna hear about the other end of this too. So Joey, go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Joey Cronagini. I'm the health center manager with the Homeless Persons Health Project. And Nicole, is it okay if I uh, share the screen for my slides? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me, let me get there. All right, can people see that? Yes. All right. Um, so yeah, I, I work for the Homeless Persons Health Project. And since we are talking about uh, you know, uh, National Health Center Week. I just wanted to give you some information about our clinic. Um, so we are located in Santa Cruz, but we work all over Santa Cruz County. Our mission of the Homeless Persons Health Project is to eliminate homelessness by providing comprehensive health care and housing for everybody. So aside from having a patient-centered medical home that provides primary care and integrated behavioral health, we do provide uh, substance use disorder services, including medication assisted treatment and acupuncture. We distribute Narcan. We have a street medicine program, um, on site medication dispensary, a 12 bed recuperative care center for people being discharged from the hospital. We manage some permanent supportive housing programs. Um, we do some housing navigation and housing case management. Um, and then we have a team that works with frequent users of the ER. I think one of the unique things about doing homeless health care is you have to really bring this to where people are staying. So um, you can't expect people to just come to a brick and mortar clinic. And so recently we obtained a mobile clinic. And while we need staffing, this is kind of typical uh, county way of doing things. We, we got this excellent mobile clinic, but we didn't have the staffing in our budget. So we're working on staffing it. We do have a street medicine committee, uh, street medicine policy and field manual. And we're working with Harm Reduction Coalition to provide low barrier medication assisted treatment out into the field. And I, I would differentiate um, street medicine from, I guess, just kind of like normal outreach uh, by saying usually with street medicine, we have a registered nurse, um, other providers like a, a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, medical doctor, psychiatrist that can that are licensed, that can really provide the, the hands-on care that people need. A lot of times it's smaller teams. Um, it allows for expanded access to care. And as you can see in this picture um, of Marie Del Rosario, one of our public health nurses, is at an encampment and she's doing wound care. And I don't know if you can see in the, the top part of the picture, um, the gentleman is actually holding up an umbrella because it was raining that day. Um, so this is a lot of the work that we do. We're not the only ones that do this. I know uh, we work with Salud para la Gente. We do a pop-up with them and Community Action Board on uh, Thursdays and, and usually they're out there on Mondays and Thursdays doing this type of work. So because we lack the staffing, we, we really um, utilize a lot of our community members and other organizations like Community Action Board, Harm Reduction Coalition, Salud Para La Gente to really provide these um, services to the community. Just in terms of numbers, there's some general numbers for the whole US of number of people experiencing homelessness. I always like to include this definition of doubled up because while doubled up people that are experiencing homelessness are not considered under the federal definition of actually being homeless. I think this is the reality of uh, a lot of people living in the United States and certainly in Santa Cruz County where you have people sharing housing with other people, um, living in a garage, multiple people living in a one bedroom. And so um, while school districts will use this number, if you look at that locally, you will see several thousand more people in this county living doubled up. Um, and I, I think that sort of reflects the true situation related to the risk of homelessness in our county. But for the sake of the, the regular definition of homelessness, we have a little bit over 2,000 people, uh, about 1,700 of whom are 
um, unsheltered. And so one of the things that recently came out, um, this is not a surprise, but a lot of housing instability is, uh, is traced back to structural racism. And there's actually a project happening at UC Berkeley called the Roots of Structural Racism Project. And um, I, I wanna encourage people to look this up. It looks at a lot of the Bay Area counties. Unfortunately, it doesn't look at Santa Cruz County, but um, you can kind of compare Santa Cruz County to Marin County in some ways in terms of the demographics. And um, in general, Santa Cruz County is, is highly segregated. So uh, these types of housing regulations go back um, go back over a century where we just had sort of discriminatory housing, uh, redlining, um, things of that nature, where it systematically created segregated environments even after um, desegregation occurred. So some of the remedies to, to address this are having less restrictive land use policies, rent control, mobility strategies, inclusionary zoning, um, and of course, more affordable housing. And actually in, in Santa Cruz County, we're pretty fortunate in that um, we do have some less restrictive land use policy. So if, for example, you wanted to do an accessory, accessory dwelling unit, an ADU, um, that is sometimes a little bit easier to do in this county compared to others. Uh, but we still have um, a lot of people and, and perhaps one of the highest per capita rates of homelessness in the entire United States. So I, we really see homelessness as a public health issue for a number of reasons. Uh, poor health is a major cause of homelessness. And that's easy to see when you look at how our healthcare system is set up. Um, somebody could be insured, but then maybe a family member gets sick. They have to take time off of work to help them. Um, because there's uh, that individual might be underinsured and might not be able to get the coverage that they need. And then maybe eventually they lose their job and then they're homeless or they have to, you know, sell their house and then they're living with grandma and then, you know, people can't pay the bills. Uh, homelessness leads to a whole range of other health problems. Um, just obviously living outside, the exposure to the environment um, is, is one of those. So in general, you will see higher rates of diabetes, asthma, um, heart conditions, and this is well documented in, in research and literature. Uh, people experiencing homelessness face uh, those disp disproportionate health conditions. And just the fact that housing instability makes recovery very difficult. So oh, we have a train coming by, so pardon that. Uh, if, if you think about just keeping medications, if you need a refrigerator to store your medications, you can't really do that easily if you're living outside. Um, making appointments. A lot of times, uh, getting your basic healthcare needs met come secondary to just finding food and clothing and a place to stay. Uh, and of course, stigma just really impacts the um, you know, systemic trauma impacts people experiencing homelessness. So uh, especially what we've seen in, in the past several months where you have multiple encampments uh, be, be cleared out, it seems like every three or four months, uh, an encampment is having to relocate and uh, just constantly moving around the stress uh, that it has on individuals' lives makes it, um, it, it's very stigmatizing and it makes it difficult for people to want to come to a brick and mortar clinic to get access to care. And unfortunately, we, we see this not only just in the type of patients that we see at our clinic, but you can, you can see it in our annual report on homeless deaths. And so, you know, here you just have some really unfortunate numbers that uh, people experiencing homelessness die about 5.4 times the rate of the housed population. Um, so that if we had the same rate of uh, mortality among house people, you would have almost 10,000 people uh, in this county uh, passing away instead of 2,000. So I, I, and just the difference in the lifespan, average lifespan of somebody who's housed in this county is about 75 compared to 
uh, about 50 to 53 years old for unhoused people. And un unfortunately, you know, just looking at the end of June of 2021, um, there are already 49 deaths of people experiencing homelessness that we're aware about, that we're aware of, and that if this trend continues, um, it'll be closer to 90 deaths this year, which is a, about a 17% increase compared to last year. Um, I, you know, it's, it's just something, it's an unfortunate reality uh, in Santa Cruz, and it's not just Santa Cruz, it's all over the West Coast. Um, and we've also seen increase in mortality among people who are formerly homeless that were housed. So we, we feel like this is um, the trauma that people experience while they're homeless, especially if they're chronically homeless, homeless for a year or more, has a profound impact on their health. And you can also see the impact that housing has on somebody who um, might have a lot of health conditions. So. This is sort of a case example of somebody that we worked with a, a few years ago, um, and we looked at their um, ER visits, inpatient days, and hospital runs um, when we were able to have this data. And this is somebody who had, um, you know, as you can see, like like forty ER visits, fifty inpatient stays, ambulance runs were just off the charts. And then um, you can kind of see the point when case management started, and you can see some of the numbers decrease. Um, and then at this point, you can see this is where when they were housed, so that April of 2019. And literally after that part, uh, after that time, there was a period of almost 12 months when that individual did not go to the ER unnecessarily. I mean, they might still have health problems. They might still have to go to the hospital for certain reasons, but unnecessary ER visits. The difference is the service type um, changed. So they started coming to our clinic or we started coming to that person and providing the services. Uh, at HPHP, we have about 100 clients in permanent supportive housing. Um, in this photo is, is one of our clients, Yolanda. She gave us permission to use this photo. She's absolutely wonderful. Uh, currently, clients have been housed on average about five and a half years. Of course, they can stay there as long as they want. Um, we provide about uh, 200 clients that receive case management from our staff, and we work within the coordinated entry system. Um, we're fortunate that we share this campus with Housing Matters and they are gonna be building this uh, large um, five-story building. I think it's a five-story building. And so you can, if you're familiar with the campus, this is sort of a bird's eye view. But within this, we'll have some extra clinic space uh, as well as there'll be 120 permanent supportive housing units on this campus uh, managed by Housing Matters. Um, and so we're excited about this. More people means more patients, means more people will get access to healthcare. And believe it or not, the expected completion date is July of 2022. If you wanna learn more about this um, and there's funding investment opportunities, please look up uh, Google Housing Matters. I know this building with purpose link, at least when I looked it up a couple of weeks ago, it wasn't really working. But connect with Housing Matters. There are opportunities to, to help invest and pay for this structure, including um, the, the clinic space, the recuperative care center, and the 120 units. We need people to help out to help get people housing. And you know, with that, we do have the smart path to housing. And um, here are some of the people that are involved with that. We have smart path assessors from Encompass, um, Housing Matters. Community Action Board. Um, this is an old slide, it says Homeless Service Center, but um, pretty much everything on here is, is accurate. Uh, and, and so again, what can you do? Um, you know, we have this situation right now in our county where these COVID motels are being uh, quote unquote demobilized. Uh, so the funding stream is, is kind of wrapping up and eventually um, up to 250 people are gonna be um, losing their, their temporary stable housing in these COVID motels uh, 
by the end of December. So they have a really great team that are called um, this rehousing wave. And I believe that's Community Action Board, Abode Services and Housing Matters, really doing a great job with trying to engage people, uh, get them linked with the housing voucher and find them housing. But um, it, it only goes so far, right? I mean, we have 250 people that need to find housing on top of all the people that are currently living outside. So, you know, we have an opportunity where we have like 270 emergency housing vouchers. The vouchers are just a voucher. We need people that will accept vouchers. So if you know landlords, if you know, uh, maybe somebody has a, a backyard unit and they're not using it or their kids moved out, um, you know, talk to them, talk to them about how can we use those units to get them paid as a landlord and to help create solutions for people experiencing homelessness. And again, I think, you know, a lot of people have concerns about um, the, the, and again, this goes back to the stigma. Well, I don't want to house those people because they're just going to mess up my unit. And, and that's a, that's a legitimate concern. Yes, it's fueled by, by stigma, but it's a legitimate concern as a, as a homeowner, right? So, you know, it's incentivizing it. There are incentives for new landlords um, in the form of increased deposits and also reminding them, like, look, this is coming with case management. There are going to be people helping keep people housed uh, to retain their housing so they have a little bit more self-sufficiency. So I included some links here, and I think it's always just important to remind ourselves to, to humanize, acknowledge, to be kind, to do what we can to reduce stigma, um, to encourage people to volunteer and, and really educate people about the different opportunities um, in Santa Cruz County with a lot of the colleagues that are speaking on this presentation today, but also throughout the, the state and the United States about different housing issues that are affecting a lot of our communities. So I didn't have a chance to check the chat, but I'll, I'll be sticking around to answer questions. Thank you. Thanks, Joey. And we'll be checking the chat too. Um, so thanks for the message and the, the great information. Um, now we're going to hear from Dina Loyos from Santa Cruz Community Health Center, and she's going to be talking about, um, in honor of National Health Center Week, about an, a really exciting health and housing project in our county that involves dentists and Santa Cruz Community Health Centers. So, Dina, all yours. Thank you, Nicole. Good morning. As Nicole said, my name is Dina Loyos, and I'm the Chief Strategy and Impact Officer for Santa Cruz Community Health. We can move to the next slide. First, I want to thank the Health Improvement Partnership, the Nicole's and Core Investments for supporting and prioritizing National Health Center Week. It's these collaborative relationships that really elevate the chemistry that we have in Santa Cruz County. And it's that chemistry that makes us a strong community. Community health centers in Santa Cruz County are not just healers, we're innovators. We look beyond medical charts to address the factors that may cause poor health, such as poverty, homelessness, substance use, mental illness, lack of nutrition, and unemployment. And most importantly, unique to Santa Cruz, we are collaborators. We work together to solve difficult problems. We put extra time in up front to create real and sustainable solutions. And I think that's really evident by all the presentations that you've heard up to this point. Next slide, please. The mission of Santa Cruz Community Health, whoops. The mission of Santa Cruz Community Health is to improve the health of our patients in the community and advocate the feminist goals of social, political, and economic equality. We will always be true to our roots. Next slide, please. Santa Cruz Community Health has been operating for over 47 years. In 1974, a small group of UCSC students launched our Downtown Women's Health Center. And then in 2014, timed with the Affordable Care Act, we opened the East Cliff Family Health Center in Live Oak. Beyond high quality healthcare, we work to build community, give people a chance to reach their dreams and contribute to the world. In 2012, we became a federally qualified health center designed to provide care regardless of a person's ability to pay. We aim to provide safe, timely, equitable, effective patient-centered healthcare to anyone who walks through our doors. 
The next couple of points I'm going to make, I will say it's not unique to Santa Cruz Community Health. All of our partnering community health centers and, and other partnering agencies, I think, fall into this description as well. We are a critical piece of the healthcare system. We collaborate with our partners, hospitals, local state governments, social health and business organizations to improve health outcomes for people who are medically vulnerable. And we have pivoted to serve our communities through telehealth, drive-through COVID testing, vaccination, mobile vaccine sites, while ensuring that our patients maintain and gain, in some cases, access to basic necessities like food and housing resources. While COVID continues to exacerbate social and medical inequities across the country, we have stretched to reconfigure services for those in need. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna touch on these briefly because everybody else that came before me did such a beautiful job, not only talking about these, but illustrating them. The impacts that housing can have on health can be seen through major, four major pathways. And again, the people who came before me, Maria did a beautiful job of illustrating these. We have stability, we have quality and safety, affordability and neighborhoods. And let's just go to the next slide. So really quickly, there's a robust body of research that exists that clearly links these four pathways to poor health outcomes. Lack of housing stability has been linked to social emotional disturbances, increased drug use in teens, caregiver behavioral health problems. The lack of quality and safety can result in asthma, poor physical and mental development, behavior problems, and avoidable falls, especially in the elderly populations. Affordability causes people to be cost burdened, forcing them to skimp on necessities like food, clothing, transportation, and healthcare. And finally, lack of safe and clean neighborhoods limits access to food, outdoor physical activity, and social engagement. Next slide, please. So the punchline, we offer part of the solution. The picture you see there on the right is a picture of 1500 Capitola Road, as we fondly refer to it. It's the address of the development, Health and Home in the heart of Live Oak. This is the next step for our community's evolution. What is it? It's an unprecedented partnership between Santa Cruz Community Health, Dientes, and Mid Penn Housing. It's like no other project in the county. The project includes 3.7 acres with 20,000 square foot medical clinic that will serve over 10,000 people. 57 units of affordable housing and an 11 chair dental clinic. Together, the partners are working to address the critical community needs of our time. The first need, not necessarily in this order of priority, but here they are. The first need is access to high quality healthcare, regardless of ability to pay. Santa Cruz Community Health will continue with our model of holistic integrated care and we will be adding new services such as optometry, pharmacy, family therapy, and telehealth. In addition, and you can kind of see it in that picture, the green between the, the Dientes building and the Santa Cruz Community Health building is a 9,000 square foot outdoor plaza where we will allow people to gather, hold events, and create community. Need number two, we know that access to dental care is key to holding a job and staying housed, but only 15% of Santa Cruz County residents on Medi-Cal are receiving dental services. And dental care is ranked as the number one need for seniors as they do not receive dental benefits as part of Medicare, making access to affordable services a priority. And need number three, affordable housing. With priority given to Live Oak residents, there will be 57 units with a focus on housing first as a way to create stability for recovery healing and to put one's life back together. We have designated four of those 57 units for on-site supportive housing, for individuals requiring, requiring intensive case management and to maintain permanent housing. Led by three long-standing community entities, we are building a hub for health, community engagement, stable housing, and linkages to other resources for family, child, and individual security and prosperity in the heart of Live Oak. Next slide. So the idea was born in 2017, followed by four years of qualifications, approvals, permits, agreements, 
And then of course a year delay due to COVID. Construction actually started earlier this year. And in fact, many of you were at our groundbreaking event in May. And we hope that we'll see you again in 2022 at our ribbon cut cutting event. It's really just right around the corner. And then the housing element is one year behind us. So they will be opening housing in 2023. Next slide. So where are we now? Having started construction just over a hundred days ago, we're making considerate progress. You can see in the picture, so up top is the, is the illustration and down below are actual photos. I think they're from last week. We have completed underground work, foundations have been poured and soon we will begin to see the vertical rise. Progress can be seen street side at 1500 Capitola Road and actually Coffeetopia offers a great vantage point to sit and sip coffee and watch the progress happen. As far as fundraising goes, we're 87% complete with many opportunities to still join. If you're interested, you can contact me directly. And next slide. So again, that's the plaza. The picture in the background there is the plaza. For more information, you can go to our website. You can go to the Santa Cruz Community Health website, or you can go to 1500capitolaroad.org and there's a construction tab. And there you will see real life um, live photos that are updated every 10 minutes. So you can kind of watch the progress day to day. I wouldn't spend too much time there in one day because in a day it doesn't look all that different, but you know, week to week things change pretty significantly. And the next slide. And so finally, I just leave you with a quote from Howard Zinn, historian and civil rights activist, give people what they need, a home to live in and health care to be well. Don't ask who deserves it, everybody deserves it. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you, Dina. That was great. It's great to see your excitement about this project taking shape and to, uh, to really literally see it before our eyes. So thank you. Um, so now we're gonna hear from Don Lane and Don, I'm gonna pull up your slides. So give me just a second here. Oops, sorry. One moment. It's not my technical day today. Okay, there we go. So I hope everyone can see that. And Don is the interim board chair for Housing Santa Cruz County. So he's going to share some information with us and then we're going to have uh, a chance to address your questions and comments as well. But Don, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Nicole. And thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to share what we're doing and to learn about all the great work others are doing. So I'm with a relatively new organization called Housing Santa Cruz County. And here you can see what we're about. We recognize that um, and push the idea that we need um, access to safe, stable, affordable homes for everyone in our community so that we have a thriving people and a thriving community. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so, the bad news that we've is um, we've been spending a lot of time talking about today. You know, there really are uh, there is a housing crisis, and the negative effect it has on people in our community is is really troubling. However, there's a sort of a good news. Next slide, please, um, and that is that really everyone in the community knows that we have this problem. We all, we all live it in so many different ways. We, we, um, some of us are experiencing it ourselves. Certainly we have family members who are experiencing it, clients who are experiencing it, family, you know, other family members, coworkers, every place we go in our world, we are hearing these stories. So we don't, the good news in this is, is that we don't really need to tell to persuade people that we have a problem and that is in our work in advocacy 
um, that um, it's useful to know that people understand that there is a problem and have some sense of how powerful and I mean, how deep it is. So what we, where we start is that we need to show folks in the community that there are workable solutions and that, that we each have a part to play in bringing those solutions forward and making them real. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and, you know, kind of our philosophy about this is that if we, you know, we can, if people are just talking about the problem, just going, oh, and wringing our hands and talking about it, um, we're, just, we're kind of stuck. And so we feel like it's very important to talk to people about opportunities. And Dina just did an, an incredible job. <laughs> Others have too, but that was such a good example of offering hope and showing what po the possibilities there are. And we need to keep doing that. And we need to show how, how much opportunity there is. Um, and then that kind of keeps people working towards solutions. Without that, we will be stuck and we cannot afford to be stuck right now. So we can go to the next slide. So um, what our organization, Hannah Cruz County, does, we, we, are, we are new and what I'm about to describe is a work in progress. We just started really in February of this year, but we are doing this work at different stages of development. And we are, one piece is advocating for very specific projects. Um, there are proposals on the table in almost every jurisdiction in our in our county and we want to show up and advocate for those projects and then there are also policy decisions being made at those jurisdictions that will help advance affordable housing so we're going to be there we also want to advance ideas share ideas about what what makes a difference again um Dina's example was so powerful because it's a reminder of that's, you know, merging housing and health physically is really helps people understand the relationship more between health and housing. Um, we also are there to support the people and organizations that are doing good affordable housing work. Sometimes those groups um, work quietly in isolation and we need to lift up their work and tell, you know, acknowledge how important that work is when they're building affordable housing or when a, when a landlord is accepting a housing voucher or when a homeowner is building an ADU. We need to, to rate, say that this is a good thing and talk about it and encourage more of it to happen. We need to educate people in the community that there are solutions there are different models um, that are working, that are in progress, and that if we execute those solution, those ideas, make them real, um, they actually house people, they improve people's health, they improve people's lives. And we just need to keep sharing those ideas with people. And then last on this, of course, is to influence decision makers. And in a way, this is not, it's not hard in the sense that I think right now a lot of decision makers and leaders in our communities do recognize that affordable housing is a big issue, but they get distracted. Other things come up that are real. I don't want to minimize the importance of other issues that come up, but we have to just keep hammering away with those folks to say, keep this at the top of your list, because even when you think about some of the other issues that they're dealing with, just around social equity and around COVID and other issues, housing ha has such an impact on all those other issues. So we need to remind them, do never let this issue fall from the top of the list. Okay, we can go to the next slide. slide thanks. So we have some very specific ways we do our work and are trying to do our work. We have a, um, a good website, which um, is growing right now. Um, and, uh, excuse me one sec, and I'll try and put that in the chat. Um, and we're, try we're constantly trying to improve that site to make sure people can see exactly what's going on with affordable housing, both projects that are in development and policy issues that are being considered. 
we have a very lively um, social media program now where we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, and we're trying to just constantly show, you know, lift up the work that's going on. We have a monthly newsletter um, for people who don't want to follow social media every day. We, um, we have put on a few community events um, to just do that education and ed engagement work. We're um, last in May, we um, helped sponsor Affordable Housing Month. Some of the groups that are on this call have, have participated in that, put on their own events associated with Affordable Housing Month. It's just an opportunity to raise the issue to a higher level in the community. And we just need to create opportunities for people to get involved through events. We have a very specific mobilization tool, which we haven't used much yet, but we will, that makes it very easy, I think, some of you are familiar with these tools on web-based tools where you can just do a couple of clicks and it'll send an email to your elected official saying, please approve that affordable housing project or please, you know, zone this area for more affordable housing. These are these are the kinds of things we need to mobilize people to uh, for and we need to have tools to make that easy for you to participate. And then we lastly, we have a are doing some work where we, when we see an opportunity, we'll help convene some people to uh, move an idea forward that maybe needs some facilitation. I'll just name one very specific, specific example. As many of you know, the Capitola Mall is gonna be redeveloped. And we were approached by some folks um, in Capitola saying, hey, could we get more affordable housing built within that redevelopment? And so we convened some experts in affordable housing to kind of brainstorm ideas about how instead of maybe that project having 15% affordable units, it had 30% affordable units in it, which would literally be another 100 units if that change happened, 100 affordable units. So we'd look for opportunities like that to bring people together who, who care about this issue, but don't but need a little boost or need a little support. And next slide. Um, and that the reason I'm here is we want to encourage you to think about joining our effort. Um, we are made up of both individuals and organizations. We have more than 40 organizations in Santa Cruz County who are part of our coalition. And we, if you're not part of it, please consider joining us individually. We encourage you to either join or just sign up for our mailing list or follow us on, on one of the social media platforms that are comfortable for you. But we, we need you um, to be part of this movement. Um, it's hard work, but there's a lot going on. This is one of the best times in recent history for affordable housing. There's more funding at the state level. There's more understanding of the issue. Um, and there's more uh, regu there's regulatory changes that are happening that are going to facilitate affordable housing. But there's also huge obstacles, not the least of which is um, that there still is resistance in the community to certain efforts on affordable housing. So we need we need to mobilize, and we need you to do that with us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Don. And thanks to all of our speakers for sharing so much information as well as ideas for different ways to get involved. So now we're gonna open it up to questions. So what questions do you have for any of our speakers or for each other or other ideas of ways to help our community provide more housing options for more people? You could raise your hand using the reaction buttons or if you'd like, you can put a question into the chat and you can do that in English or Spanish. Any questions? We have an uncharacteristically quiet group today. Go ahead, Henry. All right, I'll, ra I'll raise my hand and put something on the table. Um, Great. Uh, 
I really appreciate this. And this was something, um, 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 Nicole and Nicole, I, I really appreciate the core coffee chats. Um, there just aren't other ways of getting folks together in the same room and sharing this level of information. And um, they're all fabulous. <laughs> so I um, want to um, 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 give a plug for that. Um, as we are working on these issues, I think I've seen um, um, two big barriers for us um, from the perspective of the Watsonville Law Center and also um, Salud Parlante. I, I work with both organizations. Um, um, one is a lack of um, the local data. And certainly as we're working with, for example, the city of Watsonville, there's lots of folks at the city of Watsonville who are strong allies in housing and really wanna help with this but they will ask some very basic questions um, about the number of renters in the city and um, how many of those renters um, um, changed housing in the last six months or last 12 months. And um, that information just isn't available from sources other than us. And I know that um, Santa Cruz Community Health and Salud um, are, are doing a fabulous job with um, um, social determinants of health inventories and starting to gather a body of data. And I think that um, to, to solve that first problem, one of the things we could do is start pooling data at a regional level, um, not for someone specific grant or someone specific purpose, but so that we have this dashboard that's available when, when we need it. And then the second issue is, is something that compounds that. We um, at, at both the Law Center and Salud, um, we're working um, uh, with a lot of undocumented or immigration vulnerable families. And um, uh, they will not wait around for their court date. <laughs> if they get a scary letter from a landlord and you are vulnerable, um, and you feel that that is the exercise of power of the court, of the government, that that's attention of the system on you, you will voluntarily leave your housing, even though that is disastrous for you. And even though you maybe have a legal aid attorney telling you, hey, you have rights, um, or really excellent housing counselors at the healthcare providers or amazing help from a local nonprofit agency. And that is happening um, at a magnitude much, much larger than um, what the court reports as evictions. So we get not one number from the court, which is actually a very small number. I saw a report recently from Cal Matters that says there were five evictions during COVID in Santa Cruz County. And we have all seen there, you know, there's a lot of service providers on this call. We have all seen more than five people probably in the last month who have um, uh, um, been forced by various circumstances um, uh, to leave their housing or, um, or double up as was said earlier. Um, we're not capturing that information. And so I think to an outside observer, especially someone at a state or federal level who is thinking about where do I focus resources um, to prevent evictions, prevent homelessness, they're not seeing the magnitude of the problem because of these sub-institutional housing turnovers. And I don't think that there's a good way of getting to the magnitude of that problem without us sharing data. That's my whole pitch. And I, I again, um, just to sandwich that, um, thank you, Nicole and Nicole, for, for hosting this. There just isn't another way of getting all of us in the same room like this. Thank you so much, Henry. And thanks for those great points about the importance of really detailed real-time data and how it can inform decision-making and advocacy. I'm curious whether any of the health centers that are collecting some social determinants of health data on their electronic health records or through other means are tracking things like what, what Henry's talking about, the um, either evictions or, or people forced to leave their current housing situations, the, the turnover of housing situations. Dina, go ahead. Yeah, so we are definitely screening for that. We use a prepare screen. It's not fully implemented, but we're starting to implement it. It doesn't get to that level of detail, but definitely it screens for housing and security. Mm -hmm. And then in notes in the in electronic health records, we note if somebody is is facing eviction or or struggling with other housing issues. Yeah, so maybe there's a, a, a mini, mini dashboard we could do with some of that data 
across, at least across the health centers. Are there other questions that you have for each other or for any of our speakers? I know there was a, just a lot presented, lots of ideas, lots of potential actions. Does anybody have actions that they're planning to take out of today's talk? Maria, did you have a comment? Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just very grateful for everybody who shared the information tonight in the comments. And I just, I wanna send a reminder that the housing issue is a regional issue, it's a state issue, but regionally, um, I think it is important, like Don said, to support the projects that are done and are being worked on and not stop in, in order to move them forward. And at the state level and at the regional level, the more we can get Silicon Valley, the more we can get the Bay Area to build their own housing or neighbors in Monterey to build their own housing um, is also worth for the well-being of our region. So let's not work only in a silo, but take a moment to support efforts that will build housing in the Bay Area and, and the Silicon Valley over the hill and, and, and Monterey, uh, because all of that will ease the pressure in our own region as well. Absolutely. Thanks for that reminder, Maria. Other comments or questions or things you want to highlight or lift up from all of the things that we heard? Um, Nicole, I would just um, chime in that if as this data, if some good work is done to aggregate some of this data, we would be thrilled to have it and post, you know, share it in our affordable housing networks. So. Great. Please keep me posted about that and we'll, we'll get it out there. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, we also, we really appreciate the kind words about the core coffee chats. We feel the same way that it's great. It's been great during COVID to have a way to get together, but it's beyond COVID. It's great to have the opportunities. I think in every chat or conversation, we meet people we haven't had a chance to meet before and we, we love the idea of all of these core conditions connected to each other because it's really a part of what we're all about and you as you've all explained so well and demonstrated in your work. Um, so we do have some other things coming up that we wanted to share with you but meanwhile please keep those questions coming um, or comments. We're not quite done yet. I just want to make sure we get these shared with you before we go. And Nicole, I was actually I actually wanted to ask a question. I'm I, I guess I am curious partly in response to Henry's comments about data and kind of the interest in, you know, aggregating some of that data. I guess I'm partly wondering if there are any of those kinds of conversations happening, um, not, not just within or among health centers, but like, are those kinds of conversations happening anywhere among different service providers that um, might be asking about housing instability? Um, and I guess I'm just really <laughs> keep thinking too about this whole eviction cliff, right? That, um, and just, are there, again, like groups talking about like, what is the community response to that? And, you know, how, how can people like us know, like, okay, things are getting really serious. How do we help activate um, kind of, you know, other people getting involved or learning more or just being aware of what the severity of the, of the impact is. It's kind of like a couple of questions to some of our speakers, I guess. Um, I have one one thought on that, and it's not going to be sufficient, but it is it's it's maybe a piece, which is that with the reorganization of all the whole countywide homeless programs through um, housing for health, which you know follows right in the theme we've been talking about. I know there's a lot of emphasis there on collecting and aggregating data. It's a little more <clears throat> homelessness oriented, but it's it's also does address housing insecurity. Um, so I think there will be, um, we should probably loop some of the folks there into this conversation about data because they, they are improving their data as we speak. That's great to know, thanks Don. Okay, I think um, we wanted to highlight a, a few events coming up. Some of them, we haven't yet released the registration forms, but keep an eye out for those. 
Um, this Thursday, just a couple of days from now, we're having kind of the, uh, the last in a series of meetings related to CORE and the county and the city of Santa Cruz's plans to release the next request for proposals for core investments. So we've been um, really working on refining the core investments model, kind of redefining what it is. Um, that's part of you know, why we offer these core coffee chats and different trainings and events that we host. And so we've been also facilitating and hosting a series of meetings, some with funders specifically, some with community partners that might be applying for funding or provide those community services. The meeting this Thursday is then a, a joint meeting with those two groups to share some of what we've been hearing in these meetings about how to really kind of apply this, this newer core framework with an equity lens to this upcoming funding process. Um, they've, the meetings have been really valuable so far, just being able to hear and, and engage in discussion with a variety of people. Um, it's open to anybody, not just nonprofits, and not only if you're currently funded by CORE, we really want to hear a variety of perspectives. And so we encourage you, even if you haven't attended one of the previous meetings we've been hosting, for to get input and, and um, feedback about the CORE investments model, we encourage you to register and attend this Thursday. Uh, and then we also support some of the workshops that are held to help people learn how to use DataShare Santa Cruz County. So DataShare is a web-based platform that houses all kinds of community level indicator data, um, not necessarily yet about specific programs and their client data, uh, but really if we wanna look at how, how are we doing across our community in various dimensions of health and well-being, uh, what are the trends, uh, DataShare is a great source for that. And there's a number of tools on data share, like um, creating dashboards and uh, little re customized reports. And so we're gonna be uh, supporting a workshop led by um, the kind of staff and team from data share next Wednesday, the 18th. And so again, if you wanna uh, learn about data share and how to use it, you can sign up for that workshop. And then coming up, we're gonna be hosting a couple rounds of discussions on how different organizations are doing racial equity work within their organizations. And we're gonna have a conversation with some staff from county departments on August 31st. And then we'll follow that up with a conversation uh, with some leaders from lo local nonprofits about some of the efforts that they're doing within their organizations. So a lot of times that involves, you know, retreats and trainings with board and staff and, and management and sometimes looking at policies and procedures and, and um, program structures to really look at not just how to deliver services with a racial equity lens, but really um, kind of looking within first and, and looking at where things might need to be um, changed within an organization to advance racial equity. So we're really excited about those. We'll release the registration information about those two events uh, coming up. And as usual, we are gonna ask you to share your feedback about today's session. We're gonna launch a, a brief poll. And then also just so you know, when you leave this meeting, you will probably see in your web browser, uh, a, a short open-ended survey pop up. That's a chance for you to share any additional thoughts or comments or questions um, since these Zoom polls don't allow us to get that kind of feedback. Um, this poll, just so that you know, there's a number of questions in it that you have to answer all of them before you can submit. And once you reach, I think there's seven questions, um, then you can submit it and then you're done with the poll. And again, we wanna just thank everybody for joining us today, for being here. We always love to uh, see returning faces in these core coffee chats and uh, hope to see many of you again at upcoming events. We'll stay on for a few more minutes in case anybody has any lingering questions. Uh, but anybody that needs to go, we hope you have a good day and we'll see you again in the in the future. And special shout out thanks to all our speakers for preparing for today and to our translation team for making it accessible to everyone. To Amy and Henry for the idea of celebrating National Health Centers Week this way. This way. And I know next year's celebration will be here before we know it. So we'll see what progress we've made between now and then. So thanks to everybody for being here and we'll, we'll stay in touch.